Jim Rollins was given the task of working with middle school students, which can really be very difficult to work with because they're kind of too old to be children and too young to be adults. And, um, and, and, and Jim had this great idea, which is extraordinary. And it's really highly improbable that it would have worked, but it worked and it still works. And um, the students he had, had certain kinds of learning disabilities. So he decided to use art as an interface to literature to deal with the kinds of knowledge and metaphors that one can express visually. Unfortunately, Tim died um, when in 2017 at an early age of 62. Uh, he taught at SVA, of course, as uh, so has Angel LaCrue and Robert Branch. And we want to continue on this, uh, this kind of tradition of keeping the collective alive. Because in the 1980s, collectives were not that popular. And it has now become an area in which you could even get an MFA in social practice. So the importance of, of, of uh, the Kids of Survival, KOS, uh, really is something to look at as an original way to deal with issues and education that are important to us. Um, the collective was mostly boys and partially due to the fact that at that age, hormones run very deep and it was important to, um, to really keep sex out of the ballpark here. Um, another tricky aspect of KOS, which is now it's not no longer called Tim Rollins and Kids of Survival, but it's the KOS studio, which continues its work in museums and galleries around the world. And in speaking with Tim one day, he told me that he didn't want to just make art. He wanted to make art history. And that's what he ended up doing because this collective who are still active and doing workshops in many museums and institutions continue along with their practice of looking at the ways in which society can be mended uh, through art practice. Um, I think that Robert Branch, who was taught here last semester uh, and has a degree from Cooper Union, which is a very difficult school to get into because it has a very basic tuition and it is based on skill sets. And uh, Robert went on to do work at Columbia where he received a master's of education degree and now works at Columbia University as well. So it's my great 
pleasure here to introduce Robert Branch, who will take over from me. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen. And, uh, and I want to thank um, uh, Suzanne um, uh, for, for that wonderful um, uh, uh, for that wonderful and warm introduction. Um, uh, it's an honor to be here tonight. Even though I didn't attend the School of Visual Arts, it plays a very important part in my story and my artist journey as a member of the art collective known as Tim Mods and KOS, Kids of Survival. Um, uh, I wanted to take this time to kind of go over some of these histories um, uh, that um, Suzanne talked about in the intro, and then of course, tell you a little bit about our more uh, about our current work, um, and talk about these kind of underlying histories and uh, interesting intersections that we have made as a collective. But you know, also to kind of go over a little bit of personal history and tell you a little bit about myself. You know, um, uh, the the first thing you should know is that I I'm uh, really tall. <laughs> I'm uh, about six foot four. Uh, look more like a football player uh, that uh, that than an artist, and that always you know that was always an interesting experience as a, as a, as a young person. Um, uh, when you're young, um, uh, people always want to put a football in your hand or a basketball in your hand. But as it turns out, uh, you know, um, I, I was very clumsy. I didn't know why. And as a kid, I tore my Achilles tendon, and that kind of you know, I didn't have much interest in sports, but that actually took that off um, uh, the table. You know, I'm still a sports fan. I was born and raised a few blocks away from Yankee Stadium, the South Bronx. Um, uh, I joined KOS when I was 16 years old. And, um, and uh, but my real love was, you know, drawing comic books and telling stories um, uh, when I was 16. And as fate would have it, I met Tim Rollins and KOS. And it was a story more fantastic than any comic book you've ever read. Um, uh, the, the trajectory of my life changed when I met Tim and became part of the art world. My, my parents are blue collar working class immigrants from Dominican Republic who were only able to attend elementary school. My father um, was only able to receive a second grade edu education in, in, in Dominican Republic. Uh, my mom made it um, uh, all the way to um, uh, middle school before uh, because they were not because they didn't want to learn, but there were literally no schools um, uh, for them to attend. They'd have to go away far into the city in order to continue their studies. So, you know, they came to the country, uh, to the United States, um, uh, to make a better life for themselves. And as many immigrants do, they, 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 they landed here in the, Bronx, in the Bronx, where I live um, uh, to, to this day. And uh, they instilled values such as hard work and perseverance. But, you know, still, in spite of that, I, I, uh, that, that work ethic that they taught me, I, I had a lot of talent and creativity. But by the time I was in high school, I was on a trajectory outwards away from school. I was diagnosed with dyslexia in high school and traditional schooling became difficult for me. Um, uh, you know, uh, today, uh, you know, I'm a, a, you know, I think I'm a proud Dominican American artist and you know, teacher and videographer and I, you know, I produce work um, uh, at, at Columbia University where I lead a team of videographers. Um, uh, I do work documenting Columbia strategic in initiatives in a documentary and new style. This was a example of something that I uh, produced and directed um, uh, based on um, Anne Rus uh, Rusgard's work, uh, the water light installation at uh, Columbia University. And you know, it's, you know, when I look at this kind of really fun life that I live as a kind of artist and videographer today, and I reflect back on uh, my life as a teenager in the South Bronx, it's, it's one of amazement because, you know, this is not the way things should have worked out. Um, um, as Suzanne, as, as, as was mentioned, um, the, the Bronx was a really tough place, um, uh, a really tough place to, you know, to grow up. And I was fortunate And I was, you know, when I was when I met Tim, and I was on the verge of dropping out. Um, uh, I was at a high school named John F. Kennedy High School, 
um, uh, which is just dubbed Jail for Kids. Hi. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I met Tim and I became the first person in my family um, uh, to attend college um, uh, tuition free, which is very important to me. I would not have been able to afford to go to school otherwise. Um, I went on, as, 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 uh, as was mentioned, to study at Teachers College and Columbia University. But I want to emphasize what a leap that was. My father was a diesel truck mechanic, and he used to sit on the steps of Cooper Union and have lunch. And he never could have imagined that I would be able to kind of walk through that doorway as a, you know, as a student and eventually a graduate and then down the road become a teacher. And you know, um, uh, credit to you know the man in this picture, um, uh, Tim. He had the imagination and the foresight to say that this is possible. Um, um, and you know, he had a lot to do um, uh, with you know me achieving uh, these these sort of things that are unfortunately far too elusive um, uh, for young people and people of color in in, um, uh, in my in my community. Uh, as uh, there's a picture of me. Um, uh, when I was about 16 years old in, in KOS. Um, uh, as you can see here, the, uh, the head went from my beard all the way to, uh, used to be on the top of my head, now it slid down to the bottom of my face. Um, uh, but, um, you know, it was a wonderful experience coming into the, into the workshop and, and, and learning. Partly because when you, you know, when you came into uh, this, the classroom, uh, excuse me, when you came into the studio, um, uh, it was a, just a, a just a all encompassing experience. Um, um, it, I was able to learn things and research, and just it wasn't about what I couldn't do; it was all about what I could do. And this is a really powerful and motivating, um, uh, it, you know, experience. And um, you know, our collective is very is. No, well known for producing painting and sculpture inspired by canonical works of literature and works of art and radical pedagogy that blend into one another into this kind of unique practice. But the, but the, while we make works, part of that, part of the products that we produce were the students themselves who you know, participated um, uh, in the project. We were kids of survival. We were survived as a result of being able to um, um, make this work that uh, challenge boundaries of race, class, culture. Um, uh, and of course, were works and paintings that stood on their own in their own right. I mean, you didn't need to know the backstory to appreciate the, th the images and the, um, uh, a that we made. It helps add value, but these were beautiful um, uh, works of art um, uh, that we shared both locally and internationally. Um, obviously, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, SVA plays an essential role in my story because uh, the found, our founder, Tim Rollins, came to study at SVA in the 1970s because he wanted to study at the best school for conceptual art in the country. Um, while here at SVA, he studied with Joseph Kasuth then became his assistant. And that's where he honed this kind of radical philosophy of art of creating conceptual art to achieve transcendence and meaning. Tim, Tim had a deeply egalitarian spirit. He was from, uh, um, uh, he said the piney woods of Maine, um, uh, from, from also from a working, um, uh, from a working class family. And um, he, you know, really wanted to kind of, he believed anybody could be an artist. He was an egalitarian. And um, after graduating from SV, uh, SVA, he founded um, a, a very important um, uh, a art collective in its own right in group material, along with Julie Alt, Mundy McLaughlin, and other artists that material that um, uh, collective went on to also include Felix Gonzalez Torres later on um, uh, in, in his career. But you know, the goal of that collective was, uh, was of bringing contemporary art into community. And bringing art out of the white box and museums and galleries and focus on group shows, individual, not just individual artists, but collective points of view. And getting away from that, you know, getting away from that idea of the straight white single male genius. That was an essential part of, of our founder's DNA. Um, uh, you know, Tim didn't, you know, Tim believed that not only the people who look like him should be able to make work, art was for everybody, and it's, it's a value to our culture if we can have different voices and different participants 
um, uh, producing and making cultural products. Um, uh, so when a desperate, hardworking principal um, uh, in a struggling middle school invited Tim up to the Bronx to ask him to help create in our program for the school, Tim could not resist uh, the offer. And while he thought he would be there for a few weeks, he instead would go on to spend the rest of his life working with that community in, in the Bronx um, uh, and his residents in some capacity. And he, you know, he founded what we believe is one of the longest running art collectory, collectives in the history of contemporary art. Um, this is, you know, this, this place became the cradle for my artistic journey. And it's important to kind of paint a picture, uh, uh, and no pun intended, of what the Bronx was during this era. And I, you know, I think it's really important to kind of share a picture. Because I, you know, even when I look back at it, I had a great childhood. You know, I had loving parents, um, good families, and you know, and, and then I had teachers who, who cared about me, even though they had trouble kind of reaching, uh, you know, reaching me sometimes and giving me the right pedagogical um, uh, tools. But the Bronx was a really tough place. Um, uh, here's a picture by um, 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 uh, an artist from a, a, a called the Spirit of the uh, Spirit, Spirit of the South Bronx, and it's called Good Morning Teacher. And that's not me in the picture, but it could have been me. Um, uh, you know, on my way to school to Yankee Stadium, I would um, uh, pass by ten burnt out, abandoned buildings um, uh, and pass um, uh, the New York Yan Yankee Stadium um, uh, to to you know to school. And I think that's you know kind of a really evocative picture of what the Bronx was like. Um, uh, Howard Cursell famously said during the World Series, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Bronx is burning. And um, um, one of the things that we need to understand is the Bronx was both burning um, uh, literally and figuratively. Communities in the Bronx had been besieged by in institutional neglect, poverty, arson. This led to a spiral of crime and an exodus of at least 250,000 residents um, uh, during, um, uh, during this period. Um, uh, it was one of the poorest congressional neighborhoods um, uh, in the United States. And so when I say the Bronx was burning, I also think it's important to say that the Bronx was burning with talent. But I wanna be careful not to romanticize um, uh, poverty and, you know, and neglect. These are real problems. These are institutional problems. We've come to learn that a lot of these fires we thought were done or were ha well, you know, happened because of the rectal landlords. And indeed there were people who were literally taking money to burn their buildings down because it was cheaper to own the rubble and collect the insurance money than to house tenants. But we also learned that you know, the city failed to put enough firehouses inside of there. And so when these fires raised, they raised out of controls and they decimated um, uh, 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 neighborhoods. But in, you know, in our, in our, what, you know, the, what the neighborhood lacked in kind of resources, it had um, um, in abundance in terms of talent and creativity. Um, um, uh, the Bronx um, uh, um, uh, had artists and community organizers who innovated, created music, art, and community organizations that kept the community thriving spiritually and creatively. From hip hop musicians to other talented artists and, um, and collectives like John Ahern and Rigoberto Torres, and of course graffiti artists who were gaining renowned fame um, in artistic spaces like Fashion Moda and the Bronx Collab. Tim would often quit that he did not come to the Bronx, the Bronx got into him. Um, uh, you know, Tim uh, was a guy who would look at the Bronx landscape and say, this is not okay, but I'm gonna do something about it. He was stirred to action and he was supported by KOS, parents, teachers, and the community because he recognized that there was an educational institutional disparities that were funneling many talented members of the community away from this cultural renaissance that was also happening um, uh, there. Again, this picture is um, uh, by uh, Perla de Leon. It's called Good Morning Teacher. And it's called uh, from a, um, a photographic series called The South Bronx Spirit. Um, you know, when you walked in, when Tim first walked into that um, uh, classroom, uh, it had 12 foot high ceilings. But remarkably, 
the ceilings of the ceiling of the classroom was littered in beautiful drawings and illustrations. The kids had taken the poles that you used to open up the windows and started drawing on them. Um, uh, Tim would, uh, um, uh, would later go on to remark that it was the hip hop Sistine Chapel. And um, uh, the, um, uh, the collective was born in that classroom and later developed into an after school program that would serve as a conduit for artistically gifted students who were being neglected in public schools uh, like, like me, until they'll establish an environment and a space where students with learning disabilities, students struggling with poverty and other inner city life uh, um, problems would deconstruct canonical texts, literary classics to make change in our community and in our everyday lives, but, and, but also inspire and critique. Here's a um, uh, illustration of one of our, um, uh, one of the early works from the um, uh, collective as you can see in this example, you have painted bricks that were collected from the debris fields we saw earlier in the picture that were strewn all over the Bronx. Um, uh, to this day, I have a bit of a fear of, uh, of dogs because in addition to, um, uh, to you know, these debris fields, there are all these wild dogs. So often I'd get chased home by wild dogs when I, um, uh, <clears throat> when I was coming home from school. So it was, it was both glorious, but also not so fun some of the time, but you know, I have you know, fond memories of uh, you grow, growing up in the Bronx, because when you grow up in the Bronx, you grow up fast. And, you know, these works um, uh, were, a, were a hit right away, but the breakthrough piece um, uh, early on in, in KOS was really um, uh, the Frankenstein piece. And because this is where we kind of developed the signet, what we would later become a signature um, uh, for our work. Um, uh, Tim came up with the idea of kind of gluing all of the pages from the novel Frankenstein and putting them on the grid. And then in the hip hop parlance of graffiti, um, uh, making images and paintings that illustrate our own version of Frankenstein over the top that reflects some of the challenges that we had in the Bronx. As we mentioned, being the Bronx, going up the Bronx was kind of a sci-fi movie. It was so surreal. And so you, we you know, re reflected that in the aesthetic of, of this image um, and the kind of social realist style painting showing some of the ills and the people literally with the fist breaking through um, uh, and, um, uh, and creating change. Um, but, you know, something also happened in that workshop, uh, and, and it was an important thing is where, you know, the students wanted to make something beautiful. You know, we wanted to paint something that was different than what was outside, you know, outside our windows. And um, uh, Tim, um, um, Tim came up with this idea um, uh, that if, you know, we, that if chaos wanted to show something that we're, we're not accustomed to seeing, moving away from the social realism and moving towards an elusive kind of conceptual expressionism. Um, uh, so Tim found this novel by Franz Kafka. You know, he would often find novels that would intrigue him. Often he hadn't read them before, but, you know, the titles would evoke something to him. Um, uh, this novel was called America, and this became a conduit for this artistically the America series was based on Franz Kafka's first novel by the same name. He had never visited America, but he wrote this story about an immigrant, uh, excuse me, a kid who had immigrated to the United States, escaped, escaping a, um, uh, a, <clears throat> a life uh, over in, in Europe. And the teenager ends up falling in all kinds of, of uh, misadventures. And, um, um, and he finally ends up in the nature theater of uh, Oklahoma where he encounters these golden angel-like figures on pedestals um, uh, blowing these horns. And um, uh, KOS took Carl's surreal experience with the theater where he encountered these people playing these golden horns and Tim would break an idea, a complex, beautiful, metaphorical idea and break it into very simple terms. He would read the parts of the text um, uh, out loud for the students who struggled, re struggled with reading. And he would say, if you could play a song, of your freedom and your dignity and your future and everything you feel about America and this country, what would your horn look like? And so we started, the you know, students would start making these, chaos members started making these, these drawings, these horns um, uh, and these squiggles and they, they were kind of amazing and they would, um, uh, you know, kind of look like the shape and the sound of the creative and uh, beautiful hip hop music that you would hear um, uh, out, um, uh, out in the streets or the, 
blazing car horns for the traffic of people blazing by on the Cross Bronx, um, uh, ex uh, uh, Cross Bronx Expressway. I would just get lost in this process. I mean, drawing horns would beat me into a state of flow where I could forget all of the struggles that I had in school earlier in the day. I could realize now that the studio was a refuge for me. I would get lost in the work in the way jazz musicians lose themselves in the groove of the music. You know, I remember coming to school after day after school and you know getting into this meditative process of making work and the deep seance experience of composing these paintings. And each member would take turns trying to make horns and they would not stop until we reached this kind of visual synchronicity, uh, which was punctuated by Tim Rollins or a KOS member going boom, 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 as we um, uh, laid out the horns on a canvas. And what you have here is America One, and you can see that kind of visual boom, 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 the horns all kind of kind of competing for attention, um, uh, much of the way you would find in a middle school, um, uh, uh, middle school classroom. Um, uh, you know, these works were um, incredibly well received by both the community and critics. And, um, you know, that the uh, slide that I just sh uh, showed you was a, was a um, uh, installation from uh, Dia Center of the Arts where they collected 14 of these America paintings, paintings and um, uh, displayed them. We would go on, of course, to move on to other, um, uh, other series and make paintings. Um, uh, here's one of my favorite ones because uh, this was something that I was uh, reading in high school and struggling with at the time when I was, um, uh, uh, when I was reading it. This is um, uh, The Scarlet Letter. Um, uh, by um, Daniel Hawthorne. And, you know, again, this embodies the spirit of what we tried to do with these texts. You know, here's a classic text, New England, um, uh, 19th century. You know, what would what, what, what we, how can we relate to that? And, you know, you know, Tim would see a kid throw a book down on the floor. I don't want to read this. This is garbage. Um, uh, in order to be part of KOS, you had to at least maintain a C average. Um, uh, and you had to, you know, keep a, you know, you know, be attend, you know, attending your, your school. So, um, you know, Tim would take that as a challenge. And so the Scarlet Letter was something a challenge. He was from New England himself, but he hadn't read it. So he had to read the book. And then he started looking, you know, he read it and he read this, you know, this incredible tale of a woman who had been castigated and punished and asked to by the government, to, um, uh, the, government the, the heads of their village to wear an A for adulterer. Um, um, and instead of making a shabby A, because she was an artist, a seamstress, she made this beautiful resplendent A with red and gold, uh, gold thread. And that letter, instead of you know, being a mark of shame, was a badge of honor, because the A stood for America. It stood for artists. And so again, you know, with that challenge, and so what would your A look like? You know, if you can make an A that you know you can imbue with pride, that would you know kind of lift you and carry you into new places. And we would you know study and um, uh, and take our influences from pop culture and weave them in. Over here in the upper left hand corner, you see an A that's taken um, uh, from the Avengers, uh, from the Captain America's A, um, uh, famous from the Marvel comic um, uh, cinema films. You would see um, A's that were influenced by Greek. Um, uh, 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 culture, you know, the classroom was a lab to experiment, to learn, to teach. Um, uh, you'd, you'd learn how to create materials. I had ex ex extreme difficulty with math, but um, um, it, it, it turns out, you know, making a canvas and laying out how many pages on a, um, uh, how many pages we would need to make a painting, a frame by a certain, uh, and make a canvas by a certain size wasn't a challenge. I could do practical math. It was some of the conceptual things that I was having trouble with, and I was able to kind of hone my skills and bring my and you know and bring my grades up all through the practice of making work. In two hours, I would learn more than I would you know sometimes learn in a week in school. You know we had visitors and writers coming into the um, uh, in, into the studio. It was you know it was kind of uh, you know it, it's just difficult to describe, but it's just you had all this kind of energy. Um, um, and, and excitement, and it just you know the, it was a you know just a great place to learn. In addition to the paintings that we made, we also made sculptures, and you know we always tried to push things to the limit. Um, uh, here's an example of a work um, uh, based on Carlo Collodi's um, uh, um, Pinocchio, and um, 
what you can't tell in the image is that inside of the um, uh, of the image are the eyes, and it's, it kind of reflects this moment in the in the um, uh, in the novel where the magic, the you know the, the the magic law starts hopping away and opens up his eyes. You know, it's a kind of metaphor for as an artist having the eyes to see something, but sometimes not the ability to make it. Often, you know, pe when people read this work, you actually you know re you know read it in a you know in a kind of way that reflected more their point of view than you know what our experience was you know are you guys um pinocchios and t and tim is pulling strings no because one of the things that people don't understand is that tim was the first kid of survival you know he came to new york city to make work with us and to you know change the trajectory of his own life and when we you know kind of take took on these books and these metaphors he himself um uh, was also kind of dealing and grappling with this and and we were you know kind of having this kind of fun conversation and uh and dialogue of, you know about the the you know the essence of these novels and of course the history of of art there's another um a wonderful um a novel you know again one of those things that you probably um uh, were forced to read um uh, in in high school lit um, uh, but in a way that actually robbed the material of, you know, that's joy. This is uh, the red badge of courage. And then we, in for this work, you know, we decided to um, uh, illustrate the wounds that um, the protagonist um, uh, ends up receiving because he desperately wants to have honor. And he goes out and he, um, uh, you know, signs up and, um, uh, and participates um, in a battle during the Civil War. And of course, you know, you know, he has all these kind of teenage ideas of how amazing it will be to be a soldier. Um, and what he sees is are the horrors of war. And he runs and uh, has an accident, gets this wound. And that wound ends up symbolizing something so deep um, uh, and, and powerful. And, you know, one of the things that we start doing, we also did in KOS because we've been working together so long, is that we revisit works. And so this work ended up kind of evolving as we made different iterations. And the wounds, um, uh, which we would often put as constellations, started mor morphing into badges. And, and you know, we started drawing inspirations from, East, uh, from Eastern art. So we started to look at the designs of mandalas and some of you know the the tapestries that you know that uh, monks would make, you know make in the sand, and um, uh, you know these works ended up taking on a life of their own. And so what started off at wounds ended up becoming a constellation of planets and seals um, uh, that you know we ended up being quite proud of. But also shows the kind of transformation and involvement that you can do when you're working on a theme over um, uh, periods of time. Uh, one other thing that, you know, was interesting is that we, as the project evolved, um, you know, there were, there were limitations of being a, a studio and, and, and working um, uh, in the context of, uh, of the Bronx. As, um, uh, it was difficult um, uh, to get, um, um, to have girls stay and be a part of the project for long periods of time. Um, um, you know, we ended up kind of being mostly male in, K in um, a KOS, not because, you know, women, young women weren't uh, welcome, but, you know, there are problems with patriarchy and, you know, coming in late to, you know, stay down in Manhattan to, you know, to work off for an exhibition, you know, there weren't a lot of parents um, uh, that were willing to kind of, you know, you know, let their daughters come back on the subway alone or um, come back with a teenage boy, <laughs> but, you know, by themselves. So, um, uh, you know, Tim saw this and, you know, he, you know, turned this into other opportunities. We um, uh, made a proposal for a school um, uh, at one point so that we can kind of expand the pedagogy and, you know, um, uh, keep it broad. Unfortunately, um, uh, the school wasn't built because of, you know, change in, um, uh, yeah, for, because of political change. Um, uh, we also did workshops and um, uh, Tim would travel and he would bring us along and we would learn and teach and we would work um, uh, in communities. And in those um, uh, workshops, you know, we were able to, you know, work with the women and, um, uh, and other people. And what we would find is that the same kind of alienation and neglect and problems in terms of not having, making things and pragmatism at the center of curriculum were happening all over the country and internationally. So, you know, that ended up being a very powerful experience for me um, uh, when I finished school and I was looking what to do, well, I wanted to do 
something very similar to what um, Tim had done. And I wanted to spend some time studying education and teaching. And I spent some time teaching at the middle schools. And even though it was several years later from my original experience with KOS, the same kind of problems um, uh, um, uh, persisted. And so, you know, it, that ended up being a very interesting um, experience. But, you know, it was great to have Tim at that time when I was, you know, I was teaching every day as a public school teacher, as a mentor, kind of walking me through, um, uh, you know, how to kind of solve these, how, you know, incorporate some of the philosophies and pedagogies of KOS. And it was very difficult, you know, school, um, um, you know, schools, schools are constructed um, uh, in a certain way and they're very resistant to change. This is what led um, KOS moving from the classroom into its own after school, uh, into its own after school project, and why we've had so much success doing these, ki these kind of community workshops. So again, here's an example from a Hubble community workshop um, uh, in Kansas City that we, we did. That's me um, all the way in the back and Tim all the way uh, in, in the middle there. Um, you know, so when we, you know, well, early on, in the project, we we wanted to you know we always trying to test limits, and um, uh, we did what something that ended up being prophetic, and I'll come back to this later. But um, uh, we were we were invited by Dia to do a digital project, and um, uh, we spent some time kind of recording our dialogues. And the reason I wanted to mention this because dialogue is a very important part of what we do in a collective. We're talking to each other all the time. In the work is the work is what binds us together. And the work is how we resolve a lot of our issues, but we had to have that kind of rapport and dialogue um, uh, to, you know, to build things. So when we did this project, we, and as we've done many times, um, uh, we recorded the dialogues that we would use, uh, the dialogues um, uh, that we would have when we were producing our work. So I think this is kind of a fun time capsule if you wanted to see what our process was like and um, you know, we learned a lot from this experience. This is probably the first time we did a dramatic reading where we went into a studio and actually did a recording of how we would read the book. So it's super fun. Um, uh, here's an example of a dialogue that we had in, at the Utrecht School of Arts, which is probably one of my very earliest um, uh, teaching, um, uh, teaching, exper teaching experience, teaching graduate school students um, uh, with Tim. Uh, so, you know, we had a lot of success, successes, we traveled, we brought, the, you know, the teaching across far and wide, but, you know, we also had our fair share of setbacks. And um, uh, tragically, um, um, we, um, uh, we lost um, a, KO, a KOS member to, um, uh, to gun violence, he was murdered. And, and um, we were, at the time, we were, you know, thinking about doing works on African-American literature, Angel Abreu, um, uh, was studying um, uh, African American um, uh, literature and politics, and you know we were it started to becoming more interested in you know in you know in this kind of work, and we were look, struggling with how to represent the Invisible Man. And so George, a member of the collective, came up, saw the headline in which he was very close to the KOS member was murdered, and he took out the took out the V, cut the V. It was the word was victim, and he cut the V, he cut the I, he cut the C. And then there was Tim, and then he cut the T, and he was left with the letters I am, invisible man. And um, uh, we used that as the kind of visual allegory for this invisible man painting. And there was something that kind of drew us to this, but um, uh, we wouldn't, you know, it was really um, uh, the source of the inspiration. We didn't know it at the time was these um, uh, protest, these placards that were carried around during the civil rights era um, uh, by protesters um, during civil rights that said, I am a man. And so, you know, this is a callback to these kind of, you know, amazing protests that we need to be seen for, um, uh, for who we are and, and what we are. And, you know, this became a very powerful series of work that we, you know, that we would re revisit later on. Uh, a shot of us working on Invisible Man. We've also inversed the image where the frame is the color and the text um, uh, is, 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 the, is, the, uh, is excellent. This is another very powerful uh, painting also based 
on um, uh, a, a on a slave narrative by Harriet Jacobs. It's one of my favorite paintings because he also shows um, um, you know our evolution. You know, a lot of the things that we used to do early on were kind of painterly, but Tim's training was really in kind of conceptual art. So we're always kind of trying to figure out how do we make things that aren't painting. How do we make things that could be made by anyone? Um, um, in this case, the source of inspiration was Harriet Jacobs. And in this slave narrative, um, uh, I was also a woman who was hiding from her slave master and spent seven years in a space about five by seven. The canvas is about that size. And um, all she had was a hole through the wall and her mother would secretly bring her food. And she had to watch her life pass her by in order to stay alive because she knew that her, must, uh, her master who, um, uh, who, would brutalize her, uh, who would brutalize her would have her killed rather than have her not um, uh, be um, uh, <clears throat> with him and belong to, to, you know, belong to him. And what kept her alive was every year looking through Christmas when the slaves would wear these kind of brightly colored outfits and would get to kind of tease their, mas you know, tease their master and ce celebrate Christmas. And it would literally, the, the colors would bring her joy. And so when we tried to make this, you know, we were trying to come up with a visual allegory, Tim would ask us, what is the color of your joy? And um, uh, for a wrinkle, we decided to kind of make this in fabric and ribbons to evoke these minstrel, um, uh, co uh, these minstrel outfits, which are beautifully illustrated in a Winslow Homer painting. Um, uh, uh, and so the, the, the ribbons run down into the floor. And part of you know, what we do, in addition to kind of being in the art world, we also go into other you know, spaces and you know, making work. So we would you know, go into the garment district and um, go into all these fabric shops and uh, try to match the pink color chips inside of these spaces. So here we are, he's got, you know, imagine me, big old football player size guy, um, uh, you know, kind of look carefully looking through fabrics to try to match my color. You know, this is the kind of, you know, kind of way we kind of create space and intersect with other um, uh, parts of the community, um, uh, you know, in other, <clears throat> in other spaces. So we're rubbing elbows with FIT students and fashionistas, at, um, uh, you know, in the process of constructing and making our own um, uh, painting. This is another painting that, that uh, you know, it's very dear. It's based on uh, Midsummer Night's Dream and also shows the evolution of that kind of trying to make work. As we mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, we tried, we, you know, we do workshops and, you know, often we want to do workshops with very young children, but that was, you know, very difficult. Can you come in with my elementary school and, and, and do something? And that was always kind of a challenge, but, you know, our model was always everyone could be an artist. So we would, you know, we decided to um, 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 uh, kind of pare things down instead of working on a uh, on the actual play from Shakespeare. We decided to work on Mel Nilsson's score of *Midsummer Night's Dream*, and we decided and we drew inspiration from uh, in in the in the in the play where um, um, where Puck, this kind of rambunctious uh, little and a fairy, um, uh, puts a drop. Uh, from a mysterious flower on somebody's on one of the characters' eyelids, and when they woke up, they would fall in love with the first person they saw. Um, um, and um, uh, in there, Tim would always quip that it was his, you know, his most his favorite um, uh, definition of, uh, of art. And um, uh, I'm not gonna read it because we're a little, a little pressed for time, but you know, these works again would start off as little ink explosions and ink blots, and and we would start kind of pulling them together to again build this cosmos of explosions um, uh, and interactions um, uh, in which we would make these beautiful flowers and we would also paste their, um, um, their mirror on the canvas, create this incredible kind of space, the kind that you would find in a Pollock painting. And this is really important to, you know, important to us. You know, we were students of history um, uh, in the KOS, we had no chance to be more very serious painters, but you know, we, we, you know, we're the kind of, we really want to make objects of beauty and transcendence, things that you can just see, stand in front of and just be moved um, uh, from, you know, from looking at. It's another example in here, you can see the score um, uh, be behind there. And what was fun about this project is we kind of kind of got to do that, you know, as we started, work, as I mentioned in KOS, we would do workshops, but, you know, we also on occasion would work with our own families. So this is an example of um, uh, some of us sitting down with our children, making these Midsummer Night's Dream. And you can see 
um, uh, we would dip, we would take um, ink and make these explosions on the paper and then later cut them out to make this um, uh, installation. So, you know, what started off as an after school project just kept growing and now as a, you know, now as a family. And um, uh, here, uh, there, here's my son there standing in front of me, not wanting to pose uh, uh, for the picture. Um, uh, there's Angel Abreu and some of the other members. But you know, this aesthetic of trying to kind of conceptualize the still, what does it look like when you make a painting as a group? We wanted to always kind of move to this kind of visual space in which you can't see where one hand begins and the other one ends. This is um, uh, Origin of Species based on Darwin, where we took this idea of the kind of branching trees of evolution and started them layering them over together and building a constellation of, 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 of you know, what, what the universe looks like and what the tree and the web of life um, appears. Obviously, you know, we couldn't do our work um, uh, without transgressive and powerful figures like Martin Luther King. Tim was an amateur Martin Luther King scholar. And um, um, I see the promised land um, uh, in this work. We try to represent that visual triangle, that notion of, you know, what does it, what does the promised land look like? What does it mean when you um, um, love someone, not in that kind of brotherly love or that, or Eros love that you, you may have for a partner or a loved one, but in that form of agape love, that, that kind of love where you'll move mountains um, uh, to do what's right, to move, to do what's, you know, to do things for people who are, who need you and don't know who you are. And, you know, that's what Martin Luther King stood for. And we've been very interested in that kind of philosophy and teaching of, of, of Dr. King. And of course, you know, without, when you study Dr. King, you also have to study the works of his contemporaries, um, people like Malcolm X, who had a different vision, uh, you know, just a sharper vision for um, uh, for social for social change. Uh, while Martin Luther King uh, imagined a uh, you know a, a a promised land in which we could kind of arrive together, Malcolm X did a, a did a autopsy on the nation's psyche with sharp angles. He raised he you know he he. Um, um, he delved into the temperature of this nation. And so when we decided to make this iconographic painting inspired by the work of, uh, inspired by Malcolm X, we took the letters of his name, M and X, and you know, we kind of created this calligraphic forms that was both scalpel and fever chart. And also kind of play, had this kind of interesting play and relationship on these, um, uh, on the, on, you know, on this promise line work, even though these, um, uh, came before the promised land. I think they have this kind of interesting interplay um, uh, when you see them <clears throat> together. We're really proud of kind of the techniques. Um, uh, you know, the guys in Kiowa like to tease me because they, you know, they say, you know, you know, I'm a terrible painter, but I just want to just kind of point out how sharp these edges are. Um, uh, you know, we take a lot of pride in kind of making works that are museum quality and will last, you know, forever. So, you know, we have to, you know, if the paint bleeds, we'd have to scrap, you know, scrap it and start again. You know, these are, um, um, you know, we, when we approach a minimal aesthetic, we really, um, uh, you know, we really put our whole mind and body into this effort. Um, uh, this painting is um, uh, also based on um, Martin Luther King's, um, a collect, uh, one of his last books, you know, where do we go from here? And you know, I wanted to use this slide because um, uh, it reminds me of the title. You know, reminds me of where you know where we are at. Um, uh, once um, uh, Tim passed away unexpectedly, you know, where do we go from here? What do we do next? And um, you know, we wanted to. You know, we got a lot of encouragement from our friends, artists, um, SVA, and others. You guys have to continue and. We, you know, we, you know, we're a family. We knew that, you know, we we're going to be connected in the rest, you know, for the you know, rest of our lives, but we weren't sure, you know, how we were going to, you know, how we were going to do this, even though we had been teaching and working alongside Tim, uh, you know, uh, you know, a teacher in my own right, Angel's, uh, you know, professor um, uh, here, you know, we had to kind of figure things out. And um, it's a picture of the, um, uh, of the quartet that is um, uh, Studio KOS, which is how we've decided um, uh, to move forward. And um, uh, 
This is in front of one of the America paintings. This is up now at the Museum of Modern Art. So if you're in the city um, uh, and you take COVID protocols, you can see one of our um, uh, one of our early works. And you know we you know we decided um, um, after having a couple success, um, uh, successful workshops um, uh, in which we kind of went back and decided to do new things, texts that we hadn't worked on Tim with, you know, we said, we started to get a feel for what, you know, a post, um, uh, a post KOS workshop would look like without um, uh, Tim Rollins. And um, of course, you know, as we're getting our feet together, we, you know, we kind of start putting projects together and there's interest. Um, um, and then the pandemic strikes. And all of a sudden, all these things that we we're planning to do, you know, are, you know, are, are at risk. And then we have an explosion of, of unrest, because as we know, um, uh, when a pandemic comes, uh, people of color are disproportionately impacted by, um, uh, by the problems of, you know, of disease and poverty um, uh, during these periods. And we had the tragic events of George Floyd. And so we, you know, we decided when we were thinking about what could we do, we decided to come back to Invisible Man. And we're saying, well, how are we going to teach? We can't get together. <laughs> we had just, you know, recently kind of got our, our, you know, our, our, our you know, uh, an idea of how we wanted to move forward. What would we do? And so what we did was we kind of went back as we've done throughout our career and kind of boiled things down to their basics. Um, um, and decided to do a digital workshop. And we um, uh, got together um, um, at first set in Philadelphia um, with the University um, uh, Collaborative, and we would work with young people and we kind of visited the pillars of what we do. Um, uh, we went back to the text, we read um, uh, the, uh, the, the powerful, um, uh, words of, of, of the Invisible Man text. And um, we did a digital workshop in which we used Google Slides and Zoom to work together with young people to make a digital series of Invisible Man. And so I wanted to show you a quick clip of that, of that, pro of that process. Are we going to make history today? Yes. 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 Today. yes. I am an invisible man. No, I am not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids, and I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible simply because people refuse to see me. The invisible man now is us thinking about how that stands in the world of social media, that same element of being like highly visible while also invisible. There is this idea when you're black of feeling invisible, right? Walking into a store, people ignore you until you're the focal point of their attention, right? Books are not just to be read, but they're to be used. So now it is time to actually make the work. We're going to ask you to pick a color that symbolizes who you are. I feel like I was born with a voice, you know, you, um, you have to like use your voice, especially if you're a minority, to speak out about what's really needs to be heard. Creative artists trying to solve the problem of isolation within the context of mass connectivity can maybe reconceive the moment and say, how do we use this to build real community? You know, I wanted to, uh, worth mentioning there that that was a um, uh, representative, um, uh, uh, former congressman and now district attorney, um, uh, Keith Ellison, who ended that video. He is going to be prosecuting 
um, uh, the uh, officers who um, uh, murdered George Floyd. And when we decided to do the Invisible Man um, um, in Minneapolis with a group of teachers um, uh, and students in a way to kind of teach and demonstrate you know, our pedagogy, because um, uh, one of the things that we've decided to do um, uh, in Studio KOS, in, in addition to making work and um, working, making works of our, in our studio and um, uh, doing projects in the community is also to sp spend a lot of time talking to teachers, talking to artists about how to take our methodology and apply it. And, you know, making these works in communities is an important thing to do. We are, um, uh, you know, we are, um, uh, our society is framed um, uh, because technologies like these are supposed to be bringing us together constantly are reminding us and being used to kind of fray us apart. And so um, uh, when we did these workshops, in addition to kind of making the work collaboratively and having that kind of sewing, sewing table style approach to making work. And, and as you can see, as you saw in the video, the works would kind of appear simultaneously and we would talk about them and we'd have these kind of powerful read, read alouds of the, uh, of, of the material. We also wanted to talk to members of the community and listen to them. And, you know, so we, you know, we talked to Keith Ellison and we had a conversation about Ralph Ellison and what it means to protest um, uh, in this day and age and, um, uh, and um, uh, the role of civil unrest um, uh, in society in terms, of making in terms of making change. And we thought that this was a very important component because this is sort of the kind of research um, uh, and things that we would do if we were in the, in the studio, we would call scholars, we would read books. And so, you know, we think that, you know, we thought that the web was a great way to kind of demonstrate, model, and, you know, continue to do what we've been doing for over 25, for, for um, uh, over three decades. Um, uh, I think that kind of brings it to a close um, uh, for me. And so I think it might be a good time to open it up for some questions. And um, I'm sure there's a lot of things that I, that I, that I miss. Usually I'm able to do this um, in person. So I'll you know, have a little bit more energy and um, uh, be able to kind of read the audience better. But um, uh, I, you know, I think it'd be time to open it up and maybe you have some questions about my process. So what do you think of Tim when you first saw him? Or what did you think of Tim when you first saw him? Well, it's important to note that Tim was uh, my first um, uh, my first, you know, kind of white friend. All of the people who I've met who were white were uh, were authority figures. Um, uh, when I came into the studio, I was on a mission. I was going to, um, uh, you know, as I told you, I wanted to be an artist in Marvel Comics, and I had just, you know, I'd only been able to take one art class um, uh, at, you know, at that time, and so I peppered Tim with so many questions. And what you have to understand about Tim is that he had, he had all of this amazing energy and you, know, you keep up with you know with the teenagers so it's this great you know this was you know it was this kind of great back and forth and um you know that energy was with him you know till you know till you know till he till the day he died he just had this energy and this spirit um uh, that um uh, would you know would just lift up a room um, he would often say, um, uh, you know, he would talk to teachers and we'd do workshops and, um, uh, you, know, you know, teachers would say, oh, I'm burnt out. I don't know if I could do this more. And it's just like, listen, if you, you know, if you, if you don't have that fire, that kind of Promethean fire, you don't have that energy, you know, you may not have had it in the first place because, you know, that, you know, that's something that gets renewed in teaching and working and, you know, and providing instru instruction and working with young people. And you know that's a very important part of what um, what Tim brought. He had this open dialogue and unbridled energy and enthusiasm of making work, building community, and having fun. You know, we you know in, in addition to the work that we did, you know, we'd go out to movies, we'd have dinners together, we'd spend holidays together. Um, uh, you know, Tim was at every um, uh, major event in my life. Um, uh, after we met, and I, you know, I miss him. I miss him dearly. Um, uh, but all of that was evident in the, you know, in our first, in you know, in our first meeting. This is a guy you wanted to hang out with, and um, um, and be friends with. And I'm very grateful um, uh, that I, you know, I get that, for, you know, that I was able to spend close, have him in my life for close to three decades. Uh, uh, first of all, she says that thank you so much for this great lecture. It's very inspiring. 
I'm wondering what you can tell us about how Tim was able to get the funding and support to get the pro program started. And I'm also wondering if you have your own practice separate from the work you do at KOS or if you pour it all into the collective. Well, I, this, I, that, let me um, uh, first talk about getting my own practice is, you know, when I went to art school, I wanted to do something different, <laughs> you know, that, than painting. I wanted to di diversify. And so as I you know, showed at the beginning of the program, I really, um, uh, I still really enjoyed the vibe of working together and doing um, uh, and doing uh, work collaboratively. So I, um, uh, when I was at Cooper, I spent a lot of time studying with a very um, uh, uh, talented um, uh, artist and filmmaker named Robert Greer. So I learned all these great skills in animation and animation um, and 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 film and video production. And so outside of KOS, I do film and video production work. And it's really um, uh, there's just a lot of synergy there um, uh, because I you know I, I you know I really enjoy talking to people and teaching and I get to interview people and um, uh, then try to condense um, their thought you know their thoughts and, and try to make um, uh, you know bring beauty um, uh, to um, uh, to the work of researchers artists and other faculty so you know outside of KOS I'm a videographer and that's you know my preferred method. Um, uh, of, 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 of working. In terms of how Tim started off the project, um, um, you know, obviously he was brought there under the capacity of, uh, of teaching and, you know, he first was, you know, working at IS-52, um, uh, but the, you know, the project really grew as a result of a grant um, uh, that would allow him to kind of take the, what he was doing inside the classroom and bringing into a classroom, into a after school setting that allowed the studio to pay, his, um, uh, pay for its own studio. But that was seed money. After that, the project has always been self-supporting, meaning that we use the proceeds from our workshops and our paintings to support the work. And that includes things like, you know, paying for scholarships, um, uh, paying for travel, paying what, for what scholarships don't cover, um, uh, paying um, uh, salaries when, when you know when, when we're able to do that and fund the pro and you know fund the project. It's really important um, uh, for us to kind of be able to kind of make work and then reinvest it um, um, into the studio and keep this a sustainable practice. And now you know things do ebb and flow. Um, uh, and that's why it's helpful to kind of have a career uh, um, uh, in teaching and you know filmmaking on the side to kind of support the project. Um, uh, but um, you know the project does it has been mostly self-sustained. Um, have preconceived notions about your identity shifted the way you create your dialogues to those who may not share your background? Um, and he also is asking, oh, where do you see programs like KOS move forward in cities like New York that are consistently gentrifying? Um, and he also gives a shout out from Washington Heights. Hey, Washington Heights, um, uh, just above you in the, the Kingsbridge section of the Bronx. Um, um, and totally, yes, I mean, um, uh, you know, this pro you've we always wanted to grow. I mean, when we, one of the first, very first works that we did, um, um, well, first of all, let me say, it's, it's a two part question. Yes, they've shifted over time, but that was also a very important ingredient to the work. Um, uh, we'd often get criticized because we were doing works of Shakespeare, or we we're doing these kind of canonical texts. There were often white authors, but that was part of the interest. There was a mystery there. You know, going into these kind of books that weren't supposed to be for us and then finding commonality and learning that, um, um, oh, wow, Aeschylus, that's for me. Um, uh, as what well, you know, that that's that's for me as well. That Shakespeare, he writes for me as well. And you know, being having that kind of cross-cultural dialogue was really important when we when I was young. And then I was as I was older, and I'm trying, and we you know started to do work. And as I mentioned, um, uh, Angel Brails very had a, a very strong interest in African American um, uh, uh, literature and politics. Um, uh, but now you know that's kind of come to evolve to to you know think about people. Um, uh, from all kinds, kinds of different economic perspectives, genders. You know, we when we did our first project post Tim, we decided to work on Baldwin, and we had a totally different take um, uh, with, uh, on James Baldwin, The Fire Next Time. We started to look at it as an intersectional text, and you know, really, you know, long before this term, Baldwin was starting to talk about the complexity of being a person of color. 
Um, uh, and, and, and I want to say that because that is complex, you know, as I, I you know, I'm a cisgender male and I am, uh, I am of, of African descent, but I'm also Latino. You know, I am, uh, I speak Spanish. My, uh, in mi casa, yo lo que hablaba era español con los padres míos porque yo me entendía, porque, porque yo me entendía, porque me entendía. So, you know, I bring a very different and kind of complex experience to being a black man. And so when we were looking for works to do in our, in, um, uh, in our, in, in our, you know, in our current, in our current project, you know, we're drawn to intersectional texts and we, you know, we learn from it and we hope, uh, you know, as we go forward to kind of continue to work with, you know, and continue to work and learn and work with communities that we haven't worked with in the past before and learn from authors and, 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 other, and, and other folks. So yes, uh, there's been a lot of evolution and learning from being, uh, um, uh, from kind of delving into this text, and I've learned a lot about my identity um, uh, as a person from, from you know studying canonical literature, studying more contemporary African American uh, you know African American literature, and of course um, uh, social science and research, and teaching and traveling. I mean, I, does it, remember as I said, you know, Tim was my first white friend, but I hadn't I had only been to the United States and Dominican Republic, and I've you know, been able to travel the globe and meet um, uh, interesting people, artists. Um, um, and learn and um, uh, from other communities. I remember the shocking when I went to Oklahoma City to do a project, and um, uh, and I was taken to what was a ghetto in Oklahoma City. And I remember being shocked. And I said, "How how is this a ghetto? You know, I'm from the Bronx. This doesn't look like ghetto to me. Everybody has a home. Everybody has a house." And they said, "Well, you know, this is how you know poverty um, um, and um, uh, class structure." is um, uh, happening in a community like Oklahoma City. So it's just, that's been a, uh, you know, a, a mark of our project, kind of learning about ourselves and um, uh, in different communities throughout the experience. That's why it keeps going. Um, from Alyssa, we have, uh, what is one important tool, skill, or lesson that you learned as an adolescent that you still carry with you as a practitioner? Um, ask questions. Um, it's really important. Um, uh, it's important to kind of, to um, uh, not be afraid to make mistakes um, uh, and and be afraid. You know, if you don't actually make things and experiment and uh, make prototypes, things can remain perfect in your head, um, uh, but then you don't get much done. And so, you know, the ability to kind you know, it takes courage to make something. It takes courage to make mistakes and questions, and that's part of the process. Not everything you make is going to work, um, uh, but you have to be kind of committed to making work, doing things, thinking, and um, uh, and also once you make something, could you make it better? Can you make it bright? You know, can you can you do something different this time? Can you add something new? Can, you know, what are your what are your colleagues and fr and friends think? You know, I'm very lucky to be part of. Um, uh, you know, studio, you know, studio KOS in which that's kind of built in to the fabric of the workshop. You know, the, we, you know, we're always kind of arguing and kind of going back and forth and, and, and debating things. But for those of you who are working by yourselves, and I remember when I was working, you know, studying in school as an individual artist, that's tough. You know, it's why, you know, one of the things I think is important for you it, while you're at school for the students out there is to build those bonds, build those bridges, take advantage of your professors pepper them with questions. If I hadn't been, you know, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, peppering Tim with, you know, with questions and interests, I, you know, would have never been a part of, of, of this project. So, you know, don't be afraid to ask. Um, so I think we just have one last question from Chris, who says, thanks, Robert, awesome presentation. Um, do you think you would have taken a career path in film and the arts without the influence of Tim and KOS? Uh, you know, uh, you know, I'll be honest, it's just that without the influence of KOS, you know, the best, you know, I don't think I would have been, a, you know, um, a, a criminal, <laughs> mind you, you know, I, you know, I have morals and I have values. Um, uh, and I always wanted to make my, you know, my, um, uh, you know, my family proud. But I don't think I could have had a life of the mind. Um, uh, I don't think I could have worked in a, you know, in, um, uh, in an educational environment or teaching and learning environment if it wasn't for um, of the pedagogy, uh, you know, Tim Rollins and his graciousness and his willingness to kind of take his gifts and his privilege and, and, and share, and, you know, and share them with me. 
um, uh, and kind of um, uh, kind of nudge me and nudge me forward. So I don't think that would have been possible for, um, uh, for me. I, uh, you know, more you know, more likely looking at a path um, uh, and a life much like um, uh, Henry in the Red Batch of Courage. You know, you know, you know, if you drop out of school, you know, kind of the best you can do is kind of maybe get a job or you know go into the military so that was likely the path that i would have headed down headed down had i not you know met tim so you know i'm eternally grateful i have this kind of wonderful um uh, life these friends that um are and family that i'm going to i hope to be working with um uh you know to the day lot to the, to the day i die and um, um that couldn't have happened you know without um uh, tim's willingness to invest his time energy and effort um, uh, in this practice. Uh, well, great, thank you. I, um, I think that wraps up our questions for the evening. Yes, well, th thank you so much, Robert. I think this was really terrific. I just have one more question, which is, um, I know that the Bronx is now being gentrified. Uh, many artists are moving up to the Bronx and buying buildings because the cost is uh, affordable. Um, can you tell us the state of the Bronx right now? Well, um, uh, the Bronx, um, uh, you know, the, the, the Bronx, gentrification is a real problem um, across our city. Income disparities um, uh, make it very difficult for people who've lived here for a long time to buy in, and so um, uh, gentrification continues to be a problem. Um, uh, you know, it's a um, Tim <laughs> had this great quote where he said that um, uh, compared to where the Bronx was in the '80s and the '90s, it's like Disney now, right? Um, uh, a lot of the crime um, uh, that you know we were um, uh, that we experienced during the crack, e crack epidemic is gone. Still, there are moments of you know just very sad and kind of, kind of horrific crime that happened, um, uh, but well, you know, the thing is, uh, you know, the thing is about one of the most important characteristics of the Bronx is that it continues to change. The, the, the demographic community, the demographics of the Bronx has changed. While it was bl mostly Black and Puerto Rican and Dominican when I was growing up, now we have immigrants um, uh, from Africa and from, um, uh, and from Southeast Asia that are, you know, making, um, uh, making an impact um, uh, and putting their stamp on, on you know, on, uh, on this beautiful, uh, on, this, on this beautiful community. And so it's important um, uh, as we kind of look forward that we, that we get the state and, um, um, and governors to think about how we can invest, how we can give tools, how we can create community banking so that artists and, you know, people who are lot, lot, a long, long life residents can buy in to the Bronx's rebirth. Um, you know, we had a cultural and um, uh, and spiritual rebirth. We literally rose from from the ashes as a community. One of my um, uh, first jobs as a teenager was working for Mid Bronx Desperados, which was a, um, a, a a community development company where they tried to fix up the housing and abandoned housing and build homes for the community. And we need more of that. But those organizations also need capital investments, and they need um, uh, organizations to help them expand so that they can continue to bring housing. I think the Bronx has a, you know, a bright future ahead of it, but the problems of gentrification and economic disparity um, are ones that have to be fixed at a national level and at an international level. It's very difficult to, you know, let's say to ask our mayor to fix all of these things. We need huge sums of, of, of investment to really turn the ship around and make sure that um, uh, groups like you know KOS um, uh, can stay working here and living here. It's which is crucially important. Um, uh, a city without artists is 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 not a city that is alive. And so I you know I hope that instead of ha I hope that the that, you know that the artists who have been moved out of Brooklyn and are now coming to the Bronx that they can stay here. They don't have to keep going further and further out because that will you know kill the, the vitality and energy of the city. And as, as we're going through this pandemic and we try to kind of return the inch back, we're really gonna need a lot of creative solutions um, uh, to solve um, uh, these problems. And we're also gonna have to figure out ways, different ways to build community. That may be, you know, 
you know, working online. Maybe we have to create remote practices in order to um, uh, work with local communities. Um, uh, we're gonna have to try to figure something out. Uh, these problems are present and real. I think um, there are a lot of people who are, you know, talented and wonderful artists who are working to solve them, but they need capital investment and support from institutions, um, uh, local institutions and governmental structures. I agree. And it's probably the next frontier because of the, um, the Bronx is still part of New York City and New York City real estate is at a premium. So let's see what happens and let's see how we can make this happen. Um, you know, if you look at the way underused real estate has developed as a model uh, in not only New York City, but in St. Louis or Cleveland or whatever, uh, or even in Bushwick, it's okay. First, the artists move in, they make it hospitable, they develop galleries, they have boutiques and restaurants, and then they get thrown out, okay? Right, right. you know, the artists are the Marines of the, um, uh, of the urban housing complex. I wanna shout out my friend, Chris Farr, who, um, uh, who's a PhD in urban studies uh, from Philadelphia, um, uh, where I you know, learned that for the artists coming first and then they're also the first ones to get booted out. And that's a problem because it's the artists who make these communities livable. Um, yeah. uh, when, I, when I was a kid, you know, as a kid, I just wanna give a special shout out to Chris, um, uh, to, to John Ahern, you know, one of the most, you know, we had a lot of burnt out buildings, but we also had these beautiful sculptures. And I remember going um, uh, to the bank of my families and imagining who the people were in these beautiful paintings and, um, uh, and cutouts that he would make and plaster and hang on the wall. We need art to make our cities livable it, and friendly. Maybe something which happened in Soho many years ago um, before the interlopers came in if you can get some development going for AIR requirements with tax abatements, you may be able to uh, raise money in this way. And since we have a number of international students here who have prob probably never been to the Bronx, and some of the pictures you showed may have been astonishing to them uh, because they look like war-torn cities. Uh, this is part of America and, and, and part of the way in which the um, separation of those who have resources and those who do not become evident. And this may be a shock to international students who look to America as a kind of free society, but it is not without its discrepancies. And I think your talk tonight showed that and educated many of our students who are not aware of these issues.